is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Hook Shots podcast. I am your host, Joe Cermelli, inviting you today to open your minds, open your hearts, open your taste buds, because today we are going to go on a culinary adventure. Yes, we are. And you might be saying, Joe, what the hell are you doing to us? What is this now? Like the delicious dish? Is this all of a sudden Yan Can Cook? Oh, no. No, no, no. No, 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 it's not, it's not going to be that. It's going to be much more dark and twisted and sinister than that, okay? Thanks to our special guest. He, he's going to try and make Gordon Ramsay, okay, look like Mr. Rogers. This is, this is the culinary arts like you have never heard them before, I promise you. So anyway, culinary, right? It's a fancy word. It's a big word. You might be thinking, culinary, isn't that what I am every time I put a hot pocket in the microwave? Yeah, hell yeah, that's culinary. You're cooking something. You're being, you're being a culinarian. I don't even think that that is a word. But the reason we're talking about cooking fish today is because I think most of us, to at least some extent, right, are about the hook it and cook it lifestyle, okay? You live that release in the grease lifestyle, okay? Probably some more than others, right? I know there's probably some guys out there that stockpile a freezer full of every crappie and walleye they catch. Maybe some of you eat, you know, what you catch a little more sparingly. There's all different degrees. But I know that you guys are eating what you're catching because you bombard the Hookshots Facebook page with your spoils of war constantly. I am constantly getting shots of a fried piece of some kind of fish on a plate, in your humble abode, next to a pile of Kraft mac and cheese or some such. So I know you guys are cooking what you're catching. So some of you guys are probably wondering where I fall on sort of the spectrum between stock that freezer and let it go. And I don't know, I'd put myself probably, I don't know, less than the middle towards the release side. And I'll be completely honest. And this surprises some people, as consumed as my life is by fishing, right? I cannot live without fishing. I am not this, like, crazed fish consumer. I, I, I kind of have to be in the mood to eat fish. I couldn't, no matter what it is, I, I, I just, I'm not one of those people that could eat a piece of, of good fish every single night. Now, the irony in that is that um, oysters, shrimp, mussels, clams, crabs, lobsters, langoustines, all that stuff, squid, octopus, that I could eat three meals a day for a month straight, okay? But not not fish. Now, to take my own fish eating habits even a step further, you guys have to remember that I grew up near the coast, okay? Okay. So, therefore, what I primarily grew up eating were saltwater fish, inshore stuff, flounder, weak fish, black sea bass. That's what we ate more than anything. And if my mom or dad went to buy fish from the fish market, that's what they would buy, you know, flounder, things like that, okay? And because of that, because I had access to saltwater fish, I just personally believe that saltwater fish, by and large, eat better than freshwater fish, therefore... I, man, I, I rarely keep a, a, a walleye or a yellow perch or a trout or anything like that close to home. Now, although I don't eat a lot of freshwater fish at home, I eat a ton of it on the road, and I don't want to give the impression that, like, I think it's yucky, okay? Because it's not. It's, it's delicious. And if I had to peg what is probably my favorite freshwater fish to eat, it would be yellow perch. Matter of fact, just this past winter... Um, you know, we were out with our buddy Ross Robertson on the ice on Lake Erie, and we had, you know, good eating size, smaller walleyes, and a ton of really fat yellow perch. And, man, when you get a yellow perch out of ice-cold water in the winter, okay, and within a couple hours of catching it, have that sucker butterflied and battered and deep-fried, yellow perch is damn good. I actually like it a lot better than walleye. Likewise, I have been to the south okay, to the crappie capital of the world in center Alabama with some old-time, like, Hall of Fame crappie boys who put on the full shebang outdoor fish fry with the hush puppies and the coleslaw, and it was outstanding. Now, another one that actually caught me quite off guard was northern pike, and I've eaten that up in Canada, way up in Saskatchewan as part of Shore lunch, okay, and the Canadian guides are the ones who uh, who cleaned it, 
and deep fried it so that there were no bones in it. And it was actually quite good. I wouldn't take it over, you know, walleye or crappie or something like that. But I was actually pretty surprised at how good the northern pike was. Now, let's talk about trout, okay? In the words of Reagan in The Exorcist, you keep it away. From the time I was little to right now, I have eaten stock trout, wild trout, Appalachian trout, Rocky Mountain trout, Adirondack trout. I have eaten trout of all ilks, and it all tastes like ilk to me. And I know damn well there are some people going, are you out of your mind? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I am. Trout, to me, tastes like nothing. And don't come at me with, well, smoke trout and smoke... Yeah, dude, you could smoke a dog turd, and it's delicious. So smoking is not the answer. You can't say, oh, well, how could you say that? Smoke trout's delicious. Yeah, no kidding. Smoke trout, good. Fresh trout, cooked in any manner, caca. Now, the reason I decided to do a podcast about, you know, fish cooking tips and techniques is because I think that a lot of people, and this is myself included... When it comes to preparing fish, okay, we all have like kind of a couple little go-to recipes. We have a few little tricks up our sleeve, okay, and and I don't deviate from mine very much just because I, I, I don't want to ruin or waste a nice piece of fish. So it's like I know uh, what what I like and what works, and my wife, God bless her, will come in and be like, well, I found this recipe from Ina Garten we should try, and I'm like, look at it, and I'm like, I don't know what... What the hell is a leek? Like, I don't I don't know what that is. Just get me a bag of Lay's potato chips so I can crush them up and make a batter like I always do, okay? There's there's no need to deviate from the norm here. But the truth is, if, if you stop and think about it, fish is not a particularly simple thing to cook. I mean, fish is, is pretty delicate, barring, I guess, you know, battering and throwing a whole bunch of it into, you know, a big deep fat fryer. Hey, as long as you know what temperature your oil needs to be at so it doesn't come out like, you know, a soggy oil dripping sponge, you're good, okay? But where fish cookery gets tricky is when you start talking about pan searing and grilling and sort of the more haute couture uh, styles of fish cooking, And to be quite honest, you know, getting a nice sear uh, in a cast iron skillet on a piece of fish, I am not great at, you know, like something always ends up smoking or something like that. So I don't, I don't try and get too fancy very often, you know, because I know how to put a couple pats of butter on some fish and some lemon pepper and throw it in the broiler. And, And like I said, I think that's what a lot of us do. We just take, you know, this, the, the easy way out. In fact, like the only thing that I am particularly, you know, proud of my skills in is cooking a tuna steak, okay? Because you you put so much effort and money and time into going out to get a tuna that, like, I can't disrespect that fish. So, like, if I make grilled tuna, okay, I, I know what I'm doing, and I like 30 seconds on each side, all right? It's, it's going to be cold in the middle, baby. You know what I'm saying? But the problem with that is it only works if somebody else wants it cold in the middle like I do because that's how I eat it. So if somebody's over and we're cooking too and they're like, well, I like mine a little bit more cooked through. I'm like, here's, here's, the, here's the spatula, man. You, you ruin your own fish, okay? I don't have the heart to cook that tuna all the way through. In fact, like if I bring home tuna steaks, I think my wife and I eat more of it raw, just thin sliced like sashimi. Uh, and I got a, a great little recipe from a chef that I fished with out in California than we do having any of it ever touch the grill. And here's the funny thing about that. Over the years, I have posted, you know, Instagram photos of, uh, you know, tuna steaks or sashimi cut up, you know, with some comment like, you know, eat it raw or whatever. And in fact, the, the aforementioned chef in California I shot a great little video with him after a day of yellowtail fishing where he cut beautiful, like, you know, professional-looking sashimi from that fish and made this sauce, and I filmed the whole thing. And every single time you put something like this on social media, not so much on the Hookshots page, but, like, on the Field and Stream or Outdoor Life pages, there is inevitably that one knuckle-dragger That has to comment, well, technically, the FDA says that to consume fish raw, it should be frozen for 24 hours before eating. Just shut up, okay? Shut your knuckle-dragger mouth. 
if you would refuse like the freshest caught a couple hours ago piece of raw bluefin tuna that will ever be put in front of you because you're worried that you're going to get worms or a parasite or something, you are one of those people that should probably not ever leave your house, okay? But these people do leave their houses, okay? And you know where they go? They go right to the half-price sushi place in the half-burnt-down strip mall, okay? In middle America, half a country's length away from the closest salt water, and they gorge themselves on $2.50 spicy tuna rolls. Now let's analyze that for a second, okay? You are okay with minced up tuna uh, that you have no idea how long it's been at this establishment, which you assume follows FDA regulations, by the way, okay? You don't know where it came from, what was added to it, all right, it's stored in the refrigerator inside a caulking gun because that's what they use to pump it into the the spicy tuna rolls that you are going to order by the dozen. Meanwhile, I catch a fish that I hooked, reeled in, saw how it was gaffed, was the one that properly bled it, properly iced it, took it back and cleaned it, thereby inspecting that meat, okay, in the process. Because, dude, I've cut fish with worms. There's worms in meat, uh, you know it pretty quick, okay, and cared for that fish, okay, but I'm the dumbass for eating that one raw, okay? Think about it. Think about it. Could you get a worm or a parasite from eating uh, fresh raw tuna? Yeah, probably. Uh, I would venture to guess that you're much more likely to die in a car accident on the way to Costco to buy another surplus bag of frozen tilapia. Anyway, what are we going to be talking about today to benefit you, the listener? Well, I can tell you what we're not going to be doing, and that is like piling on a bunch of fish recipes, okay? Because that's boring, okay? Who cares about that? I wanted to glean some very useful tips on fish prep and cooking, starting from the catch, okay, to the table, that could be applied to basically any way that you already like to cook fish. All right, hey, if your thing is house autry seafood breader, pan fried, okay. If your go-to is a little bit of Mrs. Dash lemon pepper every time you go grill some fish, all fine and good. We're not asking you to change, okay. We want you to be you. But we want to talk about little things you can do that you probably, in some cases, have not thought of to make that Mrs. Dash lemon pepper mahi mahi so much better than it ever was before. And in order for me to gather this information, I needed to talk to an actual chef, which is why we are talking today to longtime friend of the Hookshots program, Matthew Roberts. Okay, but here's the thing about Matt, okay? Um, he is like one step away from like certifiable crazy person, all right? Like he's a bit of a lunatic, which is exactly why we love him. Matt is a, a glorified party animal, all right? And he is always just sort of skip-hopping all over the West. The dude's always in a different location every time he sends me something, all right? Partying with different party people and fishing everywhere he goes. I mean, the dude is an absolute fishing nut. But despite, okay, his twinge of lunacy... He is a legit chef. Now, some of you may actually recognize Matt because uh, we actually hired him here at Hookshots. Um, he's done two social media video series for us, cooking series, that ran for a week apiece. The first one was Totally Metal Holiday Food a few years ago. And more recently, just last year, he did uh, Totally Metal Thanksgiving Food. And if you haven't seen any of these, I, I recommend that you go back and watch because you have never seen an informative cooking video um, like the Totally Metal Cooking series. Because I'll be completely honest, right? When I first got this idea about fish cookery, I was like, you know, I, I, I probably have the connections if I worked a little bit to like get, uh, I don't know, Tom Colicchio to sign on or maybe like, you know, John Besh or something like Tom Colicchio fishes. And then, you know, I started thinking about it, and I'm like, man, that would be so f***ing boring. That would just be so boring. 
you know, have either of those guys ever dressed their brother up like Satan for the sake of a cooking video? No, they have not. Have either one of those men ever opened a cooking video, sitting in front of a fireplace, drinking a whiskey in their underpants? No, they have not. And it is that kind of creative vision that makes us love Matt here at Hook Shots so much. So no matter how good you think you are at cooking fish, okay, I promise you, you're going to learn something from what Matt has to say, okay? There's something is going to make you go, huh, I never thought of that, and I need to start doing that, okay? I learned many things in this conversation with Matt, including many things about him personally that I did not really need to know. Wow, so this really is totally savage chef Matt Roberts, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> What's up, buddy? Not much, man. Dude, it is so good to talk to you on the phone. We have like 30-mile-long, 13-year-old girl-style text Facebook message chats that go on forever, but I've never actually spoken to you, man. This is true. So here... It's good to hear good to hear your voice, uh, not on the computer. Yeah, there you go. Same for you, man. This is wonderful. So... Um, I did, you know, <laughs> because we keep it real, and this is Hook Shots, I do have to mention that today's recording is actually a push, right? We were supposed to do this two days ago, but one of the two of us got messed up on Fireball Whiskey and then therefore could not uh, record a podcast. Which which one of us was that? <laughs> oh, man, I got to I gotta apologize about that one. <laughs> I'll, take the, I'll take the heat on that. Holy moly. Let me tell you something about Tuesdays for me. They seem to be the wildest day of any of the days of the week. Not Friday, not Saturday. For some reason, Tuesday. Why? Why Tuesday? What's happening? In, dude, I, I mean, what's happening? First of all, every time you send me a photo or something, you're like a vagabond, man. It's like one week you're in Seattle catching lingcod, and then two days later you're like backpacking through Montana, munching on some chichi chi cheese, catching trout. Like, what? What is? What is your deal? You're like an international man of mystery, brother. Hey, that's uh, that's how I, I keep it uh, mysterious, you know? You got to keep it funky fresh. Anyway, so what happens on Tuesdays? Why is Tuesday so wild? You know, I don't know the reason for that. It, it always works out during the week that somehow it happens to be a Tuesday and some crazy shit happens. <laughs> if we were only all so lucky, my Tuesdays are absolutely f- boring. But uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah, it should be the other way around. You know, let me let me put it this way. That Wednesday morning, if I had kids, I would have thrown up in their lucky charms. <laughs> like, Dad, is that a new marshmallow? No, son, that's a piece of chili dog. <laughs> I, I also think you mentioned you, you wanted to use this time in this space, um, this outlet, to give us some sort of uh, PSA regarding Pedialyte. Oh, yeah. So I wish I would have known about this in high school, <laughs> but holy moly. You know, if you're sitting there on the struggle bus the next day, anything short of an IV, Pedialyte, get you some. (laughs) Dude. And get the grape. The grape is the good flavor. So so I actually have kids, and therefore I don't throw up from drinking nearly as much as I used to, but they throw (laughs) up all the time. So there is always Pedialyte here, and while this is much lamer, no bullshit, dude. Like, you cut the grass on a hot day and you're dying – Half a glass of that versus oh. Gatorade, dude. That's where it's at. I've actually met a lot of fishing guides who like that. they always have Pedialyte. So, I mean, there's tip number one. Oh, so it's not an unknown. No, fact. no, 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 no. And I, All right, I think it's quite delicious. There's nothing like grapes mixed with kosher salt. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that's what it tastes like. Oh man! But uh, yeah, that morning, that morning was rough. I woke up curled up like a homeless cat in an abandoned automobile. <laughs> Sleeping on my shoe, I had a donut in one hand and hot sauce in the other. <laughs> it was, it was. I rough. kept texting Needless you. You're say, like, can you give me a few more hours? I'm like, how about one more hour? And then an hour later, I'd be like, how about just one more? To the point where I was like, you know what, dude? Let's just do this another day. <laughs> You're clearly not rallying today. Yeah. My my man, my bad. No, nah, dude, it's all it's but all hey, good. You know, that's it's Tuesday. You know, come yeah, on. I know. Don't you know it's International Party Day? <laughs> all good, man. All good. So, uh, fun fact: the first thing that you ever posted on the Hookshots Facebook page that caught my attention, and I was like, "This is a dude that I could hang with," 
was your massive VHS collection. Do you remember that? Oh yeah, and I was like, oh, my yeah. God. Is, that's is, it. That's is, in storage. Is that back? Is that yeah, backdraft? My... Like you had backdraft. <laughs> <laughs> all the classics, man. I've got all, all the classics, and that's what you get for living next to a damn. We got a, a record store it's called Zia's, and I used to go in there on a Friday night. Like, all right, what am I going to get? Look for some music, you know, whatever. But they used to have this VHS sale, and it was like four mo- or five movies for twenty uh-huh. bucks. So shit, that takes care of your week right there of entertainment. Did you ever do this one? Like, we're we're so far off topic, but I'm going with it. Do you ever do this when you were younger, man? You'd go to like a thrift store or a Goodwill, and you'd buy VHS tapes that just weren't marked with anything for like five cents a piece, and just go home and pop them in, and like hope there was something really messed up on them. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, edit, edit. I never did that. Scratch uh, that. No, that was the thing. We used to go, they'd be like a nickel. It'd just be like a blank VHF. And most of the time it was like cartoons or something. But every once in a while, like, you'd be like, oh, dear. I won't say what was on them. But anyway, yeah, that was the thing. I did I did used to take my grandma's cassette tapes. It'd be like Gwen Miller, or, <laughs> you know, some big bands. And I used to ball up little pieces of paper and stick it in a two-top little plot. And then all of a sudden you got a brand new recording tape. You can record all all your favorite radio songs, you know, try to get it before the, the DJ starts talking, get all your recording songs, and there you go. You don't have to buy a cassette tape. <laughs> Ingenuity. <laughs> you cheap bastard. <laughs> so, dude, so we, yeah, like, <laughs> so I, we got to get a little backstory on Matthew Roberts because I, I know that you are a chef, which is why we're talking to you. But I've never asked you, like, dude, like, what's sort of your background? Where'd you grow up? You know, where'd you learn your chefing? So I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, and I've been cooking my whole life. And I really, I've really i been cooking professionally for about half my life now. And, you know, I've done it all. I've done, I've cooked at restaurants, wine cooking, sous chefing. I've done breweries. Uh, I cooked, I used to cook for uh, millionaires come in to this place. I, I'm not going to name any names, but this place I used to work at, we'd have celebrities, millionaires come in all the time. Can you name? Can you name uh, one name? Uh, one name. Uh, okay. I'll just say uh, I'll say a few names, but I'm not going to name them. There was uh, Marlon Schmayen, <laughs> Schmessica Schmalva. <laughs> Dude, you cook uh, Schmalish Schmooper. <laughs> <laughs> you cooked for Schmessica Schmalva. Yeah, man. But she she really only was about that salad life. <laughs> <laughs> There's so not a whole easy. lot of cooking going on. There, you throw some French dressing on it, and it's done, right? Hey, man, French dressing just galba party. <laughs> so, did you did you did you go to school for this, or sort of self taught through the ranks of of working in different restaurants, kind of deal? Yeah, see, I, I did it the smart way, and I did not go to school because okay. culinary school. Oh my god. You know, you talk to anybody, anybody that's been in the industry, and it's a ripoff. Really? It okay. Is. You're educating me, man. Yeah. Go ahead. So you're, you're, looking at, you're looking at spending anywhere from 20000 to to 100000 given a two-year or four-year class you're doing. And, uh, you know, you're coming out of, the, out of the school, and you're making like 10 12 bucks an hour. Right. right. You know, it's just, just like colleges nowadays, which, you know, kids go to college, you know, get an education, but... Right, you know. right. Well, dude, no, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's a lot of incredible chefs out there that never went to color. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, not that I'm some expert because I really am not a huge fan of the guy, but like Bobby Flay never had like a, a second of, of formal school training ever. You just climb yeah. rank and work your way up, you know, through the different jobs. Yeah, and that's 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 the way you do it. You know, if, if uh, you know, you start out, you know, start out mopping floors and work your way up. You know, you pay attention, you work hard. And you know, you then by you know, you you move up the ranks. So you have uh, obviously cooked a lot of different fish uh, in your career, which is why we're talking to you. But like, personally, you know, dude, like, what's your eater? Like, what's the one species out there that's like your fave? You can't get enough of. You know what? As of recently, it was halibut. I love mm-hmm, halibut. Mm-hmm. Halibut is a delicious fish. But as of recently, I was in uh, Northern California, and I was. Just giving out fishing, checking out this new spot for the first time. I was fishing around this jetty. Okay. And I'm like, you know, just kind of seeing what kind of fish we got going out there. And I catch this f***ing big-ass eel. Okay, okay. And I was like, oh, well, I was like, well, shit, I don't know what to do with this thing. And so, you know, I was like, 
trying to look it up real quick if it's legal, if it's not, whatever. And uh, so I, I I get this eel home is a, called a monkey face eel. Really? I've never was, heard of that. That's really what it's yeah, called. Yeah, I swear to God, it's called a monkey face eel. And it was by far of all the fish I cut out there in my time out there, it was still to this day my favorite fish. It was beautiful. Dude, dude, just delicious. It's interesting that you say that because I am a, a, a true believer that some of the most hideous, weirdest, disgusting looking fish you got the are, best are, are they, they absolutely are. Like <laughs> nobody knows what totog or or blackfish are unless you live in the northeast and saltwater fish. They're they're a member of the Ras family. They're a real big deal here. And they are hideous little buggers, man. They have these weird teeth and lips, but they are like my favorite saltwater eating fish. And if you look at like, you know, wolf fish, Dude, uh, Chilean sea bass, I don't know, I, we're not going to get in the whole history of that, but that's not even what that damn thing's called. It's like its real name is like yeah. oil fish. They're hideous. It was a chef uh-huh. that found out how great they were and changed the name for menus to Chilean sea bass. But, um, yeah, dude, white tuna in a sushi restaurant, Escalar, hideous. They're all black and grimy <laughs> looking. So, uh, But, you know, e- that's funny. Eel, like that's um, – that's a big Italian thing out here, man. Historically, like the Italians, it? yeah, they would trap them. They love the eel. They huh? love it. it was a big like Christmas time thing. I have never been a huge fan. Like I, I don't mind the cook deal and sushi, but I have never had like fried yeah, I've had eel or anything. Sushi, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, but no, that's interesting because a lot of people. I mean, it's a fatty fish, right? And that is that part of what makes them so good. I mean, you you tell me. I mean, I know eel have a lot of fat, which is why they're so they're praised for their texture and flavor. Yeah, it was it was immaculate meat. Right, it was fantastic. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and do you eat uh, do you eat your your share of freshwater fish? Are you mostly you know? You know, like uh, I'm up here in Wyoming right now, okay. and it's mostly walleye and trout. Okay, those are the big two. Now, I, I usually let go of all my trout, right. but uh, I just right. went last weekend. I was the last weekend might have been two weekends ago. We we're out at the lake and just hammer in these walleye and it was my first time intentionally catching walleye okay and i'll tell you man like i've ate i've eaten them before but they are delicious yeah yeah especially if they come out of real cold water they're they're very good and uh, you know because i live and i guess we're kind of similar you do a lot of saltwater fishing because i live close to the salt um i don't eat that many freshwater fish at home i don't really kill any freshwater fish because even though we have walleye and all that stuff here it's like I will take a simple piece of flounder, say, over a piece of walleye. I just think saltwater fish taste better. But, you know, in my travels, man, I've eaten all that stuff. And, yeah, walleye out of, like, especially if you're ice fishing or something, they're all firmed up. It's tasty. Oh, man. It is, it is really, really good. So And, yeah, going back to uh, ugly fish, man, I used to beat the piss out of freaking wing cods. And man, I would get I would get some ma- massive wing cods, but the the jewel of the wing cod is the damn cheek. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like better than a freaking scallop. It's yeah, fantastic. yeah, and you know, a lot of people. Uh, I mean, that could be said of of so many fish, and I, and I'm guilty of this too, dude. It's like sometimes you know, it's been a long ass day, and you're cutting a whole bunch of fish. It's like you just don't feel like taking the time to bust the cheeks out, but. Um, it's so much less oily and oilier fish like bluefish out here. That's an acquired taste. I do not like bluefish, but a bluefish cheek has none of that oily flavor. So I know that's a big deal to a lot of guys with a lot of different species. If you're willing to take the time to cut that chunk of meat out. Oh yeah. I, uh, I have my little brother. I, I cut a brain out of a fish one time and dared him to eat it. He was all about it. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, dude, I, I've, I've seen, I forget what show it was on, but it always intrigued me. I'd never seen it before, and again, it was over in Italy with tuna, but what these guys were doing was they were cracking the spines in half after cleaning them and literally, like, taking the spinal fluid like a shot. Gnarly. Yeah, Ugh. yeah. See, I don't, know how I, feel, I don't know how I feel about that. Like, dude, I've seen some Andrew Zimmern shit where he's eating, like, cooked, like, eyeball, fish eyes and stuff. Ah, oh, man, like... I don't want to yeah. knock it because I haven't tried it. Squeeze the gel out. Yeah, I just don't know, dude. And like they were talking about that spinal fluid, like it was the cleanest, coldest, briniest. But I'm just like, ah, oh, I, you know, yeah. I, I don't know. I'll, I'll pass. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that one. I'm not. I'm not as adventurous with fish awful as I am with other things. Like I'll try a you know a liver or a heart cooked right from anything, but I don't know fish. It's weird. But um, you know the reason that we're talking to you is because. 
you know, I think there are a lot of tricks from a chef's perspective that, um, you know, people don't realize. And I've sort of set up in this already that I am I am no master fish cooker. I have like my same little go-to recipes that are all safe and, and neat. But, you know, um, <laughs> a, a lot of a lot of good fish made at home. I mean, it, obviously, it starts when you catch it. And everybody knows that. And you've sort of laid out for us these these 10 commandments of um, fish prep and care and cooking that are that are really awesome. And some of you guys listening to this might go, oh, well, duh. But there are some that, that seem really simple that, um, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't, I, like, I didn't even know. So, like, I've, I, I've already learned something. So to sort of get into that, because I, I can speak to all these, your, your first commandment, okay? Uh, well, let me just say this before we get into that, man. You got me jumping in a snake pit on this one. Why? Because, you know, from the, the angling community, and the chef community, oh, man, there is a bunch of cutthroat b- bastards out there. You know, they're like, oh, my family's been doing this for four generations, oh. da, 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 you know. And then and on the chef's side, it's like, oh, well, that's not how you do it, eh, eh. you know. <laughs> but anyway, you know, oh, no. you guys. <laughs> I pre- no, I appreciate what you're saying. Like a chef's standards and an <laughs> angler's standards are, are always going to be different, which I think, you know, uh, makes this very interesting because – you know, you can have a, a thousand guys who catch crappies or whatever tell you how they do it, and I'm sure it's delicious. But then hearing how a chef does that, I don't know, man. There, there's too much to be learned, in my opinion, <laughs> yeah. in, in a crossover. So basically, like, so, yeah. f everybody. Okay, we're gonna do our yeah, thing. Let's we'll, we'll go through and, go through just some simple steps. Yeah, here. And, and either you you listen to what Matt has to say, or and don't and just keep doing it the same way you've always been no no love loss yeah you're you know? bastard. <laughs> so, so so your first one which is an obvious one but i i have some questions um you know comes right after the catch and that's killing the fish and bleeding it out and getting it on ice asap duh but explain why that's important with lactic acid yeah so when the fish when you're fighting a fish you know they're they're under stress and it's just like uh, like if you're hunting, you know, you're breaking down an animal. There's a proper way to do it to preserve the meat to a specific, you know, standard. You know, when you're fighting a fish, they're sitting there, they're building up lactic acid in their muscles. Right. You know, some tuna fishermen, they'll they'll let their their tuna just kind of hang out, chill out, and let it let the the body, you know, digest all that. Right. Uh, but so like you know like you fi- you're fighting a fish like a tuna and is doing a million circles around the boat you know it's like freaking out and that's that's tainting the meat you know it's the the acid tainting the meat right right and uh you know which will it'll give your it'll give your meat a little funny flavor even some discolor you know so you want to try to get that you know taken care of like asap you well, know get that is it also fair to say, based on that, that like uh, if you, if you're really fishing for the table, the the quicker you know, the less time, uh, you, you, the shorter you keep the fight, right? The quicker the fish is dead and on ice, the better the flavor of the fish. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Because you know, with with bleeding a fish, and there's there's several different ways to do that. Um, like in my experience, like with my with my crew of friends and anglers, we tend to bleed bigger fish you know we bleed a tuna if we're taking a striper Absolutely. we bleed yeah a like striper. a little a little brook trout isn't going to be as big of a deal okay. as a big you know saltwater fish right so that was that was my question though i mean you know if, if you're catching i mean a little brook trout's a uh that's that's real small but let's say you're catching those walleyes did you bleed those walleyes you caught i mean whether there was lactic acid buildup in a in the short fight of a walleye because we know they don't really pull snicker, snicker, sneer, sneer. Yeah, um, you know what? Is That's it still going right. to? Like, <laughs> these fish—they're just coming up like slugs, you know. <laughs> that yeah. that aside, I mean, if you know you're killing that fish, is is bleeding something you know like a walleye or you know something that, that's not going to fight for an hour? Is it still going to make that meat taste better, or does it really not matter? Probably not as noticeable. Okay. You know, it's it's you know, it's not going to be a significant change in okay. flavor. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, the bigger the fish, the harder the struggle, the more lactic acid. So, this is this is not necessarily a step that uh need to be worried about by your your panfish guys then. Correct. Okay. But ice of course, um instantaneous. Yeah. I mean, when we tuna fish, 
That fit, I, I've I've dealt, I've talked to some California guys. They all keep uh, tuna spikes on their boat, uh, and it, I mean mm-hmm. it sounds like it is what it is. It's an ice pick, and they know exactly where to hit it, like three where inches them, behind yeah. the eyes, so that that fish isn't even flopping around and bruising itself. It's yeah. like in the boat, gaff, spike to the head, and on ice in less than thirty seconds. You know, yeah. I, I mean, I know obviously that rule applies to anything that you're going to eat. Um, mm-hmm. And fish, fish meat, you know, it just it breaks down so much quicker than any other meat. Right. You know the en- the enzymes in the fish and the meat that you know it just it immediately starts starts taking that fish apart. Right. Would you say from a from a cooking perspective that like even something like pan fish or something like that, you know, is it is it is it still better to throw a you know a live fish on ice than say you know have them on a stringer in the bucket. You know, all day till you get them home. Like, is is, yeah. is cooler <laughs> I'm, I'm by guilty. straight up? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm guilty of that. Growing up, you know, we just throw them right on a stringer and chuck them back in the water to keep them cool. You yeah. know, I've never had a problem with any uh, pan fish. You know, right, sitting out there in the water. You know, just keep the fish cold. Right, right. You right. know, like don't have them sitting on the bank in the sun baking. Uh, yes, yeah. That's that's a pretty obvious one. That's a pretty obvious yeah. one. So Easy you, step. your your second commandment, and this is a great one. Okay, and I I man, I yell at so many people for this all the time. You do not rinse a fish with uh, fillets of a fish with fresh water unless absolutely yeah. necessary. Ra- wrap absolutely. on wrap on about that one because this is a, yeah. a pet so, peeve of mine. You know, yeah, when it's in the fish in fresh water, that fresh water just absolutely changes the whole texture of your fillet. Right. It turns it to mush. It it you can see that you can see the difference of when you first cut it off the fish and to when you rinse it, you're like, oh, what is it? You right. know? And are you only yeah, talking so, saltwater fish here or, or would you would you not oh, even rinse fillet? No, fresh Both. fresh and okay, salt so water. Fresh and salt yeah. water. Once you have a straight fillet, do not rinse it in fresh water. Do not rinse I mean you can make a, a little easy trick is uh, make a, a salt water brine. Okay. And then if you're going to store this fish, like say you want to eat it in a, in a day or two, I know sometimes I get home from fishing trips, I got a bunch of fish, like, well, shit, I got to clean these, but I don't feel like eating them tonight. I'll have them in my fridge for a day, maybe two days, you know, keep that fish dry. Right. Pat right. that fish down, keep it dry. Okay. Yeah. Pat, it. Right. Okay. So patting the fish dry, that's what, just to go back real quick though, to the rinsing, because I've done this where like I've cut fish and maybe there's a little bit of blood on the meat or like a couple scales on the meat. And then you go give like a piece of that fish to your neighbor or something. And they're yeah, all freaking like, grossed Ugh. out. They're like, Ugh. <laughs> uh, you know, and I know. the first thing I've that people want to do, way too, like, dude, oh, you didn't, you didn't clean this fish. Dude, I have, I have cut fish for people on the dock and like, I turn around and they're like spraying, the fillets with a hose and I'm like, just throw that whole thing in the water right now. Like yeah. you just <laughs> give, it, give it to the sea lion. killed like you absolutely killed that. So that yeah, that one is luckily one that I've known, uh, because it is true, man. I mean you accidentally get a little fresh water on a fresh flounder fillet or snapper fillet, like it's it's shot. It's absolutely shot. Yeah. Clean the blood off, which goes right into your 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 next deal here. You know, um I have heard chefs say that you can give it a quick cold water rinse if you need to, like right before you're about to cook it. Is that right? Yeah. Or you don't even recommend yeah. that? Well, you know, I mean, if you're going to cook it right away, there, that shouldn't be a problem. But make sure that if you are going to do that, that you dry it before you cook it. Okay. So let's get on. Okay. So that's your third commandment is patting that's, fish That's dry. number three. Go for it. Go yeah. for it. Getting the fish dry. You know, you got extra extra moisture on the fish. That causes the fish to steam. Steaming causes the fish to get mushy and squishy. Okay. So you want a nice dry fish, you know, uh, you know, before you put on any oils or herbs or seasoning, you know, make sure it's nice and dry. This is a great one, dude, because this is one where I have failed miserably. I always, I tend to pat fillets, you know, the paper towel or something before I cook them, but I'm doing it more to just like sort of like give them that last little like clean up i i have never paid enough attention to it to try and make sure it's totally dry like would you actually recommend like leaving them out for a while like you would before smoking or something to like you want legit dry to the touch absolutely like you don't want it to where it's going to be sticking to your finger dry sure sure but any any of that extra water you know like anything is breaking down or any bit of a little bit of juice you know just kind of 
kind of sop that up and, uh, you know, you're good to go. Right. Right. Okay. And, and yeah, cause I'd never really thought about that. The moisture in the fish creates a cooking effect that you don't really want on top of whatever you're doing, which is steaming. Yeah. So. It, yeah. It's just gonna, it's gonna turn your fish to mush. Okay. Good. Good. Moving along. This is, this, this is all, this is all great shit. Like you sent me these commandments. I'm like, dude, the dude nailed it. <laughs> no, he couldn't drink that much fireball. <laughs> so you're, you're, I wish I wish it was just fireball. Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! Uh, that was a that was a salute, a cocktail of uh, of no no. Well, <laughs> well, next podcast we'll just talk all about that. So, dude, this was this this commandment commandment number four. This was positively one of my favorites, man. Um, if you have frozen fish, let them get to room temperature before you cook them. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we all, we all have frozen fish or at least at some time in our, in our career and in our lives, we've had frozen fish and like, you know, like, Hey, one night I'm just going to fire up this. I'm going to fire up that. You know, some people I've seen it. They don't, they, they they'll pull it right out of the package, kind of let it thaw out and then start cooking it. You're like, Oh, well, you know, it's, it's kind of weird in the middle. Right. Well, it's like, yeah, buddy, you know, yeah. you gotta let that, let that get, let it rise up to room temperature, just like a nice steak, you right. know, right. you gotta, you gotta let it, cause that, you know, if it's, if it's getting, if you're cooking it when it's still frozen, you're going to have a, a gross dry outside okay. and sometimes even a pink middle. Okay. So here's the interesting part about that. The, the, the letting it thaw completely part. Okay, I get that, but what I wasn't aware of is the room temperature because what I often do, and maybe I think a lot of people do this, so maybe, dude, you tell me if this is the wrong way to go about it. If I'm going to pull a, a piece of fish out of the freezer, okay, I usually let it thaw in the fridge. So even when I go uh, to yeah. cook it, it's still not room temperature. So I've thawed it, but it's not, it's still cold. So I mean, yeah room temperature if you actually let it sit like, out you're, you're is, not is talking better. like you know 70 degrees but you know like around 50 degrees 60 degrees okay you know, not just not just cold cold like you're just pull it out of the damn cooler at the grocery store you know like let it rise up in temperature right and and this all ties into just obviously even cooking of fish yeah yeah so i mean from 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 a culinary perspective right because this is not really on your commandments but um you know, how do you freeze fish? If you're going to freeze fish for yourself to eat, because I am, I am a firm believer, right? And people are going to jump all over me for this, but I, I just, I really don't care. I've had nine different iterations of vacuum sealers, okay? From like the Kmart model to like the Vacu Suck 9000, whatever. And no matter how good I think they are, like that fish never tastes as good to me. So no, you, you got to make sure like you, you're uh, getting all the oxygen out of there, right? Well, yeah. I mean, as much as the Kmart brand, yeah, as much as it all suck out of there, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, I know to pat it dry. I just, I don't know, man. Like, you know, is is there something in in the cooking world, you know, a, a method or a process? You know, because I look, I look, I know the drill, right? Unless you're at a restaurant where they truly have that fish fresh that night, okay? You, you eat a lot of frozen fish at restaurants. You do, like you go yeah, for, around you the get, country yeah, for yeah. sure. Did you go get fish and chips somewhere at the diner down the street? That dude didn't have cod dropped off that morning, okay? <laughs> but it still it still tastes delicious to me. Whereas yeah. you know, I'll pull a, a you know a, a, a piece of flounder, or a striper, or whatever that's been backpacked in my chest freezer outside for a couple months, and man, it's just like no matter what I do to it, grilled, bro, it just doesn't taste as good to me. So, you know, what does what does a restaurant do to freeze fish differently, if 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 anything, than like the recreational sportsman? Oh, uh, you know, every restaurant I've ever worked in, we've got fr- we got the fish in fresh. So you worked so, at the good places. You know, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's funny up here in Wyoming, everybody hates seafood. And really? I get it, you know, they, Wait, they do not like seafood. You can't, you can't meet a person who likes seafood up here. And, you know, I'm guessing because it's so damn landlocked, there's no freaking fresh fish coming in. Right. But, uh, oh man, I, I go through the grocery store and I see some of the, the selections and I'm like, ugh, I cringe. <laughs> All of the muscles are open. 
Right. <laughs> all the shrimp are like haggard looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And I don't blame them. You know, I get it. You know, like you're like freaking two thousand miles from any any ocean. Well, well, sure, yeah. But so, like, where you live, like, if you had a, a hankering for some good seafood, like, there's not one fancy joint that really does it right and gets it in that that day. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe if you're lucky, like a day or two. Right, right. You know, I mean, like there, there is some good, there is some good cuts of fish that I have bought here, but it's, it's, uh, you know, salmon that they get flown in is probably, sure, you know, within sure. a week. Right, 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 right. Well, so, so yeah. no tips on the freezing because I mean, working in magazines. Yeah, you I, know, it's, I've heard everything you from know, freezing in a block of water, you know, to do this, to do that, and and I've tried it all, man, and. Most of the time, I'm. Uh, it's, that's a that's a risk. That's a tough one, you know. It's everyone has different fl- freezers. Different uh, parts of the of the country has different climates, and you know, some some build up freezer burn, some don't. You know. Yeah. It's a uh, that's a tricky one. So, so that that's you just said something there. Maybe you can expand on a little bit. Different climates, different parts of the country. So it, it's like for the same reason that I can't get a good slice of pizza in Florida because the dough doesn't rise the same down there. You're telling me that different altitudes and regions will will do different things in a chest freezer in the garage well as far as garage freezers go you know like you're going to get you know more humid places you're going to get more moisture built up you know and it's not it's not you know it's not it's situational you know it's it's situational for everyone's freezer yeah see mine so don't in... jump on me everyone all right <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's situational <laughs> yeah mine's in my garage and every time i pull a piece of fish out it oddly like tastes like uh elio's pizza because there's a whole lot of that yeah. in there, too. <laughs> yeah. You so, know, and I, I have noticed that about some freezer bags. Some freezer bags let in scents of other food, I, and some don't. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think that that may be a part of it. But I do know that with freezer bags, again, like, the drier you can get that fish, you know, because that, that's always what it is. It's like there's a little bit of ice crystals from the slight bit of moisture and uh, – you know, if you're not eating it within a couple of weeks of freezing it, it's man, I just it, it's bad. It's gotten to the point where if if I catch something that I really want to eat, I tend to I'd rather keep what I'm going to eat over the next couple of days fresh and like give some to neighbors rather than ever freeze it at all. Like rather than go back to a piece of frozen Absolutely. fish I don't really want, I'd much rather that you know my neighbor or something you know get a piece. Yeah, someone but, else enjoys it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I, I try not to freeze uh, too much fish. Anyway, commandment number five: selecting the right application to cook your fish by Matt Roberts and begin. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so what I would recommend as far as cooking your fish indoors, outdoors, get yourself a stainless steel pan, steel pan, a cast iron pan. Or just a nice grill setup, nice clean grill setup. So steel pans, you got a lot of, uh, they have a lot of good heat retention and distribution. Okay. They don't have any hot spots, uh, any cold spots. Uh, cast iron, you know, you can put that on multiple cooking services. You can bring that from the campfire up to, you know, a stovetop and put it in the oven. Okay. Uh, these are, these are all good pans if you want to get a nice sear on the fish. Okay. Now, some people, you know, like I've cooked fish on the nonstick pans, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of controversy on the nonstick pans. But if you really want to get a nice, good sear, get a good, get yourself a good stainless steel pan. It costs a little bit more. It'll be worth it. Right. Same with the cast iron. You know, you take care of a cast iron, you're going to have that your whole life. Yeah, dude, and I, I have a cast iron skillet that I love, and I, I've read up on how to take care of it, and it's been great. But um, so, in other words, what you're telling me is you're not a huge fan of the Yoshi Copper grill mat. <laughs> you know, they are making <laughs> innovations with technology in these pans, <laughs> but you know, it's 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 just not it's not a uh, a favorable pan. These uh, these non stick right. Teflon type pans for uh, for cooking fish. If you want to cook like a fish, uh, you know, like medium or light and you don't want it to be that good you know be my guest right right well dude this is great because uh, i mean come on man that's what everybody has like you know like yeah you know, my mom know, runs out and buys <laughs> like the the copper pan from like big lots or whatever you know like that's just what people uh-huh. have like so, look what i got sweetie yeah are you know, excited yeah she's like i got uh, you, yeah, you know thanks. I got you. I got you the. I got you the copper uh, French fry oven make. I'm like, oh, thanks. As Mom. seen on TV. Yeah, it, it, it always it is. But no, dude, that's that's great. Cast iron or steel. And you also had put a note in commandment number five 
Um, you know, you, you, you said the grill. They all, they all, well, okay. Let's talk about grills first. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. I love grilled fish. I prefer it to be on charcoal or wood. Absolutely. Okay. I, so I, grills, grills are, uh, you know, this is where a lot of people get into trouble. You know, it is, there's a very fine line between cooking fish and it's, it's called a dry heat method, you know, cooking it on the grill. Right. There's a fine line between overcooking the fish and cooking it just right. There's a, a high probability your, your fish can disintegrate all over the grate. So, like, a few steps you want to take into consideration is setting up your grill properly. You know, you want to have start with a nice, clean grill. Get your grates all clean. You know, the leftover hamburger from, again, last 4th of July. <laughs> get that off of there. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's uh, my get grill. Your grill yeah, get your grill grates clean. And then start with a nice, high grill. You know, like 400, 450 degrees. Uh, and then you want a, a, a nice lubrication on there too. Okay. All right. And what's your lube of choice? So there's a few different ways I'll go about this. You know, uh, sometimes I'll do, uh, just some spray grill spray, you know, just Pam or, like Pam you know, or whatever grill right, spray. Right, right. Yeah. Or, uh, sometimes I'll do a box with some olive oil on it. Sometimes I'll do an onion. An you know, onion. you ever see that trick? No. Yeah, you get an onion no. slice. Yeah. So get you a nice healthy onion slice, you know, stick a fork through there or a knife or, you know, and skewer and, uh, you know, put a little olive oil on there and then, uh, just kind of brush it up and down. You know, really? Good way to apply. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, that's what I learned in the hood, from really <laughs> in the hood, you know, back in onion town, let me tell you about what we did in onion Is town here. Yeah, nuts. I dude, and and like that's probably one of those people are like, really, Joe? Like you never heard that? No, dude. I'm always like just <laughs> mopping it on with a brush or whatever yeah. olive oil. I've no, I've never thought about applying with an onion. That's fantastic. Yeah, that is fantastic. And it gives it gives the grill a little flavor too. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And you you also said in Commandment Five, you know, it's all about starting with high heat. Um, and I know Absolutely. that, I know that for, for certain speed, like, you know, a tuna steak. Yeah. I'm only cooking it for 30 seconds on a side and I want that grill friggin' raring. But I, I think that might surprise some people because I think a lot of people are so afraid of burning fish or they know that it cooks so fast that they don't tend to do that. So tell me a little bit more about this, like starting on high heat always. Okay. So start on high heat. It's going to get your grill set up, uh, and it's going to prevent, it's going to help you prevent your fish sticking from the, sticking on the grill. So it'll stick less when it's hotter. Correct. All right. So yeah. So you get your, you get your grill nice and hot. You get some oil on the grill. So you got a little bit of a uh, protection and then you lay your slab down. Now it's, it's easier grilling some of the fatter fishes. You know, you got your tuna, your halibut, your salmon, your swordfish. Right. Those are the easy fish to cook on a grill. You know, if you want to do a, a smaller fish, you know, like a, a like little trout or, you know, a pan fish, you know, uh, get an old fish basket. Yeah. You know, like that's the, that's the, that's the easy way of going about it. Interesting. But, Very uh, interesting. Yeah. So, so. and it, and it, it depends, you know, species to species, you know, uh, you figure about eight, eight, 10 minutes per inch of thickness on the fish. Right. Right, right, right. So, you know, how often like do you, um, I when I cook fish at home, I, I tend to be cooking, you know, boneless fillets. How often, you know, is there is there sort of a culinary benefit, like a taste thing, to you know, doing you know, whole gutted fish, scored fish versus fillets, like you know, or do you just do that based on sort of size of the fish? Because the the one thing I do love, and I don't get it that often, because I'll only get it in Florida, is like when you go to a good you know back alley cuban joint and they'll do a whole crispy fried fish for you you know what i mean oh yeah i love that pescado I, frito exactly <laughs> yeah. i do not have the skills nor the balls to do that at home like stir fry you in my wok uh, cuz i don't want to ruin anything but you know is there um you know the sort of as with mammals like is there an enhancement of flavor when you're grilling a fish or salt, whatever with bones in versus bones out I I don't, I've never noticed one. You okay. know, it's uh it's what you what you're putting on the fish and what kind of fish you got working with. You know, like you can do that with snapper, you know, or uh you know, I've seen uh in the Mexican restaurants are using tilapia. 
Ugh. You know, it's just, Ugh. you know, yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> there were, people tell me, like, oh, I ate this really healthy dinner of tilapia. No, like, you, <laughs> you eat a fucking science experiment is what you're eating. That is not yeah. a fish. <laughs> But yeah. no, I've I've always yeah, wondered you know, that. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I've never noticed any difference between bone in, bone out. I prefer boneless. The less shit I got to get through to get my meal in my belly, you know, the better. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, yeah, it's it's like the whole the whole crispy fish deal. You know, I've had it. Asia, I've done have I've had it at Asian restaurants, Cuban restaurants. Um, you have to not mind picking bones out of your mouth, and that's just such a yeah. turn off to and, a yeah. lot of people. And you know what's funny? Because I man, I bust some chops for my friends like Kerber all the time. If if I'm eating a whole fish, then I know I'm going to be getting some bones in my mouth. But if you fillet a fish for me, dude, you some bitch. If I find one bone in there, I'm gonna, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna flip out. Okay. <laughs> So I I do it all Absolutely. the time because Curbs is a charter captain. He cuts real quick and he does a great job. But every once in a while, you know, speed, and I'll have to text him a picture. I'm like, "What's this?" And I'll always be like, "The bones I left in your mahi, so you choke on them." <laughs> you know. So it's like if you're telling me it's boneless, it better be boneless. Otherwise, you know, it's that's all, right. It's all good. If I get one bone, we're having issues here. <laughs> so, yeah. So commandment six is about uh, getting rid of fishiness, and this is this is one of those old school tips that I've heard, and I've never actually known if it's legit or not. So tell tell me about the milks. It could be our milk. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's it's a chemical in fish called a tri trimethyl trimethylamine, I believe. Okay, sounds uh, right. And that's what causes your yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, more, you know <laughs> chemical scientists over here. You know. yeah, it's like tri- trimethylamine, I believe, is what it, what the chemical is. Is what the what causes the fish to stink. Now, uh, you know, say you got a fish that uh, you know, you're just not quite sure about. Right. You know, you you put it, soak it in some milk, and it could be anywhere from 20 minutes to overnight. And what what the milk does is the casing in the milk it breaks down the that chemical. Really. And it it, it works. Right, it works. Right. You know, well, some people use beer, but, uh, you know, milk's a sure thing. Really? Yeah. So I, I've heard that. I mean, that's a pretty old school tip. Um, but the reason I don't ever do it, man, is because I am, I am not a huge fan of any I'm, – I'm just – like, I don't like mackerel. Like, I'm not a big bluefish guy. Like, I just don't really gravitate towards oily fish. And I know, I know that some people, some people do, but, like, you know, whenever I get the sushi deluxe platter, I'm like, I'll, I'll give you five bucks extra for no mackerel. Okay, but um, yeah. <laughs> because yeah, because I don't cook them myself, I've never actually tried that. But hearing it from a chef that that is a legit thing that can be done um, is interesting. Absolutely. So a brief soak in milk yeah. will, will and, take away and, the fishiness. And that's you know, like in a restaurant, you know, people generally know what the fish is going to taste like, and right. you know whether or not they like that flavor. And so it's a good household tip as well. Sure. You know, like somebody who, who just caught a new fish, they're out on a, a new spot and they want to try this new fish, you know, and they're like, oh, whoa, it smells a little for me. Right. Yeah, throw it in the milk. Right, right. Throw it in the milk. You heard it here first. Oh, yeah. Commandment seven. You know, but first you got to buy the milk. Right. <laughs> you know? the milk I'm, not the... A, I'm not a big milk drinker. I stopped <laughs> drinking milk in high school. Like, I think only psychos drink milk now. <laughs> really? That, what, wait, why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> milk, I don't know, man. It's it's just a different breed nowadays. It also you know, shouldn't be uh, spoiled uh, milk. Like test the milk if it's been in there for three months. Don't soak yeah, your fish in don't, that. Don't don't soak your fish in the spoiled milk. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, and, that, and another point is, you know, it's it's you know, let it be dairy milk. You know, don't don't go trying the almond milk. Or, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, try it if you want. Let so, me know how it tastes. Yeah, yeah. It has it has to be from cows, people. Not squozen yeah. from an almond <laughs> nut or a soy shoot or whatever uh, you people drink. Anyway. All you right. know what I do like? I like a nice big glass of squirrel milk. <laughs> I like to go find these squirrels around and, and I, I milk the shit out of them. <laughs> oh, uh, man. That's not true. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We should move on to commandments. We should go to number seven, all right, which all is right. selecting the there right utensils for cooking your fish before this shit gets way out of whack. Yeah. <laughs> so... Save your trip. Save yourself a trip to the hospital. Uh-huh. You know, save yourself some skin and blood. Freaking get, you know, invest in a nice fillet knife and some protective gloves. If you if you're getting a fish right out of the water, you're gonna clean it up. Get yourself the proper utensils. So you know, pulling the fish from the water, get just a nice knife. I'm not endorsing any 
blade or another, but there's some good ones out there that makes the job incredibly easy and almost fun. Well, dude, you know, you what's, know even what's, though, what's funny about that is I'm a huge fan of just a straight up fillet knife, and I know down south absolutely. and in a lot of places in the country. Like dudes are all about their electric fillet knives. Electric knife, yeah. I, you know, I can't get into them. I mean, maybe if I had to on a daily basis, you know, fillet, you know, a dozen if trout they, if and redfish. They just had, if they just had the uh, the samurai training like we have, you know, they wouldn't have to use their fucking electric knife. I've, I've, had, I've had no samurai training. I just, I just feel like. I can get more so meat. Fun. Yeah, I. <laughs> I just feel like I can get more meat off of it. Like I do it more justice taking my time yeah. with a fixed blade yeah. rather than burning it with an electric. Blasting yeah. through, and and to yeah, each their absolutely. own. Like I said, I'm not filleting you know thirty sea trout at a time like these guys in the south. But that's it's refreshing yeah. to hear that because I am a fan of of fixed blade. But you would also mention in Commandment Seven, write down the cooking utensils. Old school spatulas. Yep. Yeah. So the fish spatula. You know, don't go getting out the the old spatula that you use to flip burgers and smack your girl's butt with. <laughs> Get yourself a nice fish spatula, and it's called a fish turner slotted spatula. And what the advantage of these spatulas is is that they're thinner, and you know they got a little little less room from the fish to uh, you know whatever your cooking surface is. And it, it helps you lift your fish with these without just shredding it to shit. Right, 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 right. You know, and and a, a new, another point about that is is when you're cooking fish, especially on a grill, you know, try to not flip them more than once or twice. You know, like I'll, twice is the most I'll do, and that's if I'm trying to get like a nice X grill mark or you know, right, right, like minimal fancy, fish handling the with ladies. the proper utensils. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, and th- and that's that's a great tip, man. Because like, you cannot turn fish on a grill with like a plastic egg spatula. I have a, I I do have that. I do have a nice big metal spatula for that. Um, what do you think about the? So, are you talking about the ones? They also make spatulas that are spatula and tongs mixed. You like two separate things, tongs no. and spatula. Okay. <laughs> no, no, that's more I've seen yeah. on TV. Put those, shit. Put those tongs down. Don't <laughs> don't get dad's old steak flippers out. Yeah. You know, you're just gonna you you got to pick up the fish and you just. And obliterate, you know, obliterates in the in, in between the tongs. Right. You know, get yourself if you're going to use tongs, get yourself a nice pair of uh, skinny tongs that's going to effectively grip the fish. Sure. And not, you know, explode it. Sure. Sure. Okay. All right. So, commandment number eight. I like this one. Forming a nice barrier between the cooking surface and the meat. This sounds technical. Absolutely essential. Not necessarily technical. Okay. Throw some shit on the meat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sorry, everyone. Uh, I like to cuss. Uh, I don't. I cuss like I use the word the. Oh, dude, so I my, apologize. My, my bleep button. This is going to be a new record, but that's yeah. okay. That's why we love we're, you. We're gonna we're, we're gonna wear it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah shit's real. <laughs> yeah. So so put a barrier between the fish, uh, between the fish and your heat source. You know, once you get your fish patted dry, uh, you know, you get it up to room temperature. You know, you get you get your favorite seasonings. You know, some people like lemon pepper. Some people like just salt and pepper. Some people like barbecue seasonings. You know, whatever you like, what you want to do is, you know, put something in between the fish and that heat source, and that's going to help you also from not having the fish stick to the grill. Okay. Um, but like you say, like, okay, for somebody who's very simplistic um, that only likes just plain salt and pepper, uh, to make that like a – Is there a difference between what you're talking about, like, you know, sprinkling it versus, like, crusting it? Because when I think of of making a barrier, like, is a little, you know, flick of salt and pepper a barrier enough? Or are you talking about, like, you know, season that sucker up and, like, kind of crust it sort of deal? Well, you know, it depends on on what you're trying to accomplish with your meal that night. You know, most of the time, all I do is salt and pepper. That's it. Really? It's real simple salt and pepper, yeah. Most of the time, that's all I do. Some, uh, Some nice kosher salt, coarse crack course the uh, cracked pepper and so, then uh, if they i want to put some other flavor on there then i can incorporate that later so you big sauce guy or or do you like oh, oh yeah i love sauces okay but you don't prefer to cook sauce your it up, fish fun. <laughs> but you don't prefer to cook your fish in them you'd rather cook the fish simply and then no, add to I, it yeah, later no the only time i'll ever put sauce while it's cooking is if i'm like trying to build a nice uh a nice glaze up on it 
Okay. But 90, 99% of the time, I do the sauce afterwards. Okay, so this is... Because I like a, to make a lot of fresh sauces. And- sure, sure. So this is interesting then. I would, I would have to imagine, with that being the case... You're not a huge fan of marinades for fish. I mean, because, I mean, you know, I'll never forget, dude. Like, I don't know how many captains I've interviewed. And I did this piece, like, my first couple of years at Saltwater Sportsman. I interviewed, like, 30 captains. And one of the questions I asked him was, um, you know, what's your favorite way to prepare your fish? And, like, three quarters of them said, uh, I, I put the fillets in Italian dressing and soak them in Italian yeah. dressing. <laughs> the old Italian dressing. Dude, trick. come yeah. <laughs> on! Like that's your that's your shit. Yeah. So you know, being a chef, uh, you you know you, you can you can make brines for fish and and it's good. You want you know you don't want that on uh you know, on your bigger fillets. You're gonna want to use a, a brine. Uh, not want to use it, but. You know, if you're going to do anything, you make a little brine, which is you know, a combination of cold water, salt, sugar, and, you know, put whatever else you want in there. Right. But, uh, yeah. but as far as, uh, marinating, I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to do that, if you're going to go that route, uh, make sure you're not doing a lot of sugar because that's where you're, where you're going to get in trouble is, uh, when your sugars start to caramelize and then you're going to get those sticking and your fish is going to go with them. Right. Right. Okay. So, okay. So a cold brine, good. Dunking the fillets in Hidden Valley Ranch, bad. <laughs> no, yeah, not, <laughs> no. <laughs> now, if it's Kroger Ranch, that's a different story. Oh, I'm Kroger. Kidding. Oh, nah, yeah. I'm straight. I'm about that Hidden Valley life. Kroger. You guys have Kroger Coast. out there? No, we ain't got no Kroger out here, man. <laughs> that's, a, got, that's a Southern thing. Yeah. No, I know. I know. No, I've never had Kroger uh, brand ranch. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so, so moving along here and this is, I'm glad you're, you, you've gotten into smoking because I do smoke a lot of fish and I mentioned like oily fish that while I'm not too keen on cooking them fresh, you know, I'll smoke some Bonita. Uh, while I, I really, I, I don't, I don't really keep trout either, right? Like I don't, I don't, I really don't like the taste of trout, but if I have to keep one or have one die on me, it's good smoke. Smoke it yeah, up, man. Yeah, it's you, good. If you're going to do some justice to it, smoke it, right? So. Um, Absolutely. You 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 say here that uh, how how critical the right wood is for smoking. Absolutely. Yeah. So what you want to do? I mean, smoking is like probably some of the most primitive ways of cooking fish. Sure. You know, dating back you know way before any of us any of us were here in this country. Uh, yeah. You know, you want to select the right wood. You know, you want a nice mellow wood that's not going to overpower the fish. Because you know, I've done it before. I'm guilty of it. You know. Uh, but the wood you want to go with is something nice and mellow, like an alder, a cedar, a maple, peach, some citrus, some cherry, something that's, uh, you know, it's a, a lighter smoke. It's not going to completely consume the meat. Right. You know, so, so you want to so, taste your fish. So, so not the same bag of hickory and mesquite chips and chunks from Lord Jensen that you just did them ribs with. Absolutely not. Like as, as heavy as you want to go is like an oak, a, a pecan. You know, and that works better with the stronger tasting fish like mackerel or amberjack. Right. You know, like those, those will, they'll be a little more forgiving. But I got a good tip for you being in striper country. Come on now. Come on with it. Grape vines, my man. Grape vines. Really? Grape vines? Yeah. Grape vines for striper. Great. Really? So you just, you just solely do grape vines or like you mix them yeah, in with the Yeah, if you wood. can get a hold, yeah. Yeah, as, as a wood, you know, cooking wood, you know, uh, get it, dry it out. Uh, or if not, you know, if you want a, a more smoky flavor, you know, toss it in with uh, some charcoal or in a smoke box on your gas grill. But, uh, yeah, get get some grapevine. Grapevine? It's a I nice, never heard nice, that, man. Yeah, nice, mellow smoke. Now, where'd you pick that up? California wine country? Yeah, this is, uh, you know, just little tips I pick up around the road. Back in your days hitchhiking through Napa? Yeah. <laughs> Hitchhiking through Napa. <laughs> Don't pull over, honey. Lock the door. <laughs> they see me coming, man. You know, look at that. <laughs> Dude, no. I mean, coming from you, that's because I, I love I love smoked fish. And, I you know, I tend to make it like that's what I'll use stuff that's in the freezer that I know I'm not going to just take out and cook like a steak anymore. So I make it a lot around Christmas, do smoked fish dip, all that stuff. Um I actually don't think it would be that hard for me to get my hands on some grapevines, man. I mean, that's I that's think you awesome. should try it out. Let us let us all know how how it went. 
because uh, it's uh, uh, what I hear from people on the West Coast that have been to the East Coast is is that's a that's a little you know hush hush thing that and I guess not too hush hush if you're on the east coast but right you know uh, that is definitely tasty I've tried it it's delicious and I recommend it awesome man awesome well dude it's it's I probably have never heard of it because anywhere there's a lot of wineries I'm like I don't want to be here like for whatever reason there yeah. are wineries there I'm don't like go. this ain't this shit ain't my scene I need to not be where the wineries are. See, what you got to do, Samuel, is you go in the, on your wine tasting and you take a plant home with you. <laughs> <laughs> Just rip that straight out of the ground. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. <laughs> uh, Tour was great. <laughs> we'll see you. <laughs> I'm going to do it. You think I'm joking, but I'm going to find a way. Yeah. There, there is there is some – the wine probably tastes like piss, but there is one right up the road from here, uh, and I might have to pop in. It's near yeah. one of my snakehead spots. Go figure. So we Absolutely. we have we have one more uh, commandment, and the way you wrote this was get a f-ing digital thermometer. You cheap bastard! <laughs> 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 yeah, the number way the number one way to f- up your fish is overcooking it. You know you can't right. uncook a fish. You know, like cooking fish is it's a delicate process. It's not like a burger you just walk away, grab a beer. Talk with talk with your boys. Come back, you know. Like you want to be there on the grill, making sure you're doing it to perfection. So, you know, uh, if you're if you're hesitant, if it's if it's your first you know time cooking fish, and you're kind of hesitant on cooking fish, uh, you can try with a try a, a wet cooking. You know, like you're uh, poaching or uh, or uh, bra- mm-hmm. braising the fish. You know, you can't really dry out the fish as easily as if you're doing it on a grill, uh, you know, in, in, or in a pan even. You know, I've seen people burn the crap out of fish in a pan. Like, dude, where were you? Right, 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 right. Well, and obviously the proper temperature is yeah. widely varying depending on the fish and the thickness of the filet. But, I mean, is there, um, you know, let's just let's just say for the sake of argument, you know, you're talking about a, a piece of fish, you know, an inch or two thick, like a halibut or a salmon or whatever. I mean, is there like a, a magic internal number, like general yeah. sort of thing? Yeah. So, for what the uh, what the health officials uh, recommend is one forty uh, to one forty five yeah. for fish. You know, and that and okay. it, it depends on the fish too. You know, what I mean, like you can eat a piece of tuna. You know, I like my tuna pink in the middle. You know, we all like it pink in the middle, yeah. right? Am I right? So, get yourself a digital thermometer. They're not hard to find. You know, don't go get an old candy thermometer or the old meat thermometer. Get yourself a nice digital thermometer that's going to give you the exact temperature. You know, you buy it, you calibrate it in ice water, and then you're good to go. You know, you, you can and that and it goes with any meat. You know, if you if you don't want to overcook chicken, you cook it to temperature. Right. Well, I think actually one of the the the, the more poignant things you said within that commandment was. You know, fish is not the kind of thing that you slap on the grill and go drink a beer or kick the soccer ball around with the kids. And, I'll, dude, I'll never forget this. I was on a trip in Louisiana with a whole house full of industry dudes, all, all friends of mine, right? Uh-huh. And we caught a whole pile of yellowfin that day, and there was only me and one other guy in the house from the Northeast who actually knew how to cook tuna. But we were, we were, having, a, we were having a good time, right? We were getting our beer on and just, like, you know, yucking it up. And, like, we didn't really feel like cooking. So one of the other dudes volunteered to take all this tuna we caught out back to the grill. And, like, everybody's hungry and sitting there waiting. And, like, just for the hell of it, my other buddy from the Northeast walks out back. And he sees this, this tuna just, like just blazing away <laughs> while they're out there drinking beers and he runs out and he's like dude 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 dude, dude the tuna's done the tuna's done and the, the guy goes oh i haven't even flipped it yet oh and no just like, oh, <laughs> shit. You know? it's more like canned so tuna at that point yeah it, yes it was like a giant steak of uh bumblebee Ugh. but um bumblebee tuna i i got it <laughs> bumblebee tuna. your balls are showing uh, <laughs> Dude, we could do we could do a movie we could do one where we just don't stop talking in movie quotes. Oh man, I could go all day long with me. Yeah, <laughs> dude, we we have we have got to hang. You have got to be in a hook shots at some point. Oh man, oh, and you know what? Huh. Before we go, so I will so I will say this, dude. This has been excellent. I learned something. I don't care who out there thinks they're the expert. Like everybody should have taken a little something out of this that will make you a better 
home chef and get the most out of the fish you catch. So I, I appreciate so. it immensely, man. I appreciate it. And uh, now we'll get away from that. I'm going to throw you under the bus. All right. For three years now, <laughs> Matt has been chipping away with footage on a show that that he is is working titled Rods and Roads oh, man. throughout your travels, <laughs> and he has been sending me little snippets and little clips of this for three years, and each one is f- funnier than the next. And I'm like, when am I going to see a pilot of Rods and Roads? I want this. It oh, can be man. better than Hook Shots because <laughs> no way, if man. you think that like you guys are the guys, if you think that like. Maybe, but if you think like I'm a little off base and like <laughs> don't mind saying things to anybody, dude, your you, your stuff is just. I don't like, give a. You just straight up walk into. Bu- I, <laughs> I want rods and roads. The people want rods oh, and roads. Man. When, I know. when am got, I going to get a I got pilot? Footage coming out of my ears, you know, and it's dude, and I never and I never think it's good footage. enough. That's the thing is like I keep going back no. and editing the the piss out of it. Dude, you send me clips of like a one-eyed hobo at some watering <laughs> hole in nowhere, Colorado, and the guy's just like, "Welcome to season one, rods and roads." And I'm like, "Who's that guy?" And you're like, "Oh, I don't know, just, just some dude." I asked some, to say that. The bar. <laughs> when do I see this man? Come oh, on, man. that was the real reason I, I wanted know. to talk today. It was I've all got, a ruse. I've got so much funny footage, man, and it's just, oh my god. It, I, okay. I, it just keeps escalating and escalating, and, and you know, it'll 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 be out. It'll be coming. All right, all right. Cause yeah, I got to get out there and fish with you, f-ers, man. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. That was the one, the only chef, Matthew Roberts. Now, maybe I'm the crazy one here, okay? But like, if I were an executive at the Food Network or something. Like, that would be my guy, okay? Like, you know, like, you think Guy Fieri's edgy or something? Can you imagine, like, a Matt Roberts does diners, drive-ins, and dives, or, like, a travel show like Bizarre Foods? Okay, think about that. I would like to be the executive producer of such an endeavor because I swear if you guys could see some of the clips that Matt has sent me for this this ongoing rods and roads project you would lose it i mean no filter will approach anybody will say anything to anybody you know if matt had a cooking show like a travel cooking show that shit would need to be on hbo okay not viceland not the food network it would have to be on you know hbo late night and maybe someday that'll happen i don't know but i hope that some of you guys took something out of what he said and was like, oh, man, like I never did that before when I cook fish. You know, I'm going to adopt that principle, okay? I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy a good spatula. I'm going to jack my grill heat all the way up. I'm going to season the grill with an oiled onion, something that makes you a little more excited the next time you slap some fish down on the skillet or on the grill grates. Now, all this talk of of eating fish, I have to leave you with a quick story that it was like my nightmare in terms of eating fish. And this happened several years ago. I'm sure some of you have watched the two-part series of hook shots that we shot um, on the Amazon in South America down there, peacock bass fishing, which was an incredible trip and like a, a longtime dream of mine to go down to the Amazon and fish. And now, as I mentioned before, okay, I'm not a huge eater slash lover of freshwater fish. And, you know, when I do eat them, I don't know, I'm fairly particular. It's kind of situational, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, a yellow perch out of icy cold Lake Erie in the middle of January, fire it up. A yellow perch from the ditch with the shopping carts in it, you know, behind the appliance store down the street from my house, I'm good on that. Northern pike from the crystal clear waters of Cree River in Saskatchewan, fire it up. Northern Pike from the Passaic River in North Jersey, not a chance because you're, you will glow if you eat that. Snakehead out of the Delaware right down the street from me. Yup, absolutely. Snakehead out of some side channel cesspool covered with oil and PCBs in Philly. No, keep that. 
So needless to say, I am a little bit particular on that front. And when we arrived in the city of Manaus, which is the biggest metropolis in the central Amazon, okay, it had been a really long day already, okay, long flights, early morning out of Miami, you know, everybody is exhausted. And of course, you get there and it is like 4,000 degrees because you're on the equator and you got all your luggage and it's just really tiring. And we were going to be taking a mothership from Manaus to the lodge where we'd be staying. So we had two or three days, I think, on the boat and then two or three days at the lodge. So our group gets off the plane. We go through customs. It's like a hell show. And then we load up this van and like every crevice of your body is dripping sweat And all we want to do is, like, get to a point where we can sort of unpack and relax a little bit. But before we did that, the guys running the trip said, you know, we're going to do a little city tour. And the first place they took us was the gigantic fish market in Manaus. And, you know, this is exactly the kind of place you see on Bizarre Foods or on River Monsters. I mean, sprawling. I mean, like, square miles of market, okay? And it was was pretty damn cool, you know? Like, I I, – it was a – Amazing experience, I mean, to see this much fish, like this kind of operation, you know, with the boats coming in right there. But I got to tell you, and this is this is not a knock, it's just it's just the point of fact that we're a little bit spoiled here in America, okay? I mean, you have all these fish laid out on all these tables, every variety of fish in the Amazon, and man, there ain't like an ice cube to be found in the entire joint, okay? There ain't an air conditioner, there ain't a fan. If it's 4,000 degrees outside, it's 4,500 degrees inside where people are just like throwing piranhas around and like unrolling giant slabs of arapaima on like a hot, slimy table. You know, there's flies everywhere, there's guys spraying hoses everywhere and like slime water rushing under your feet down into all these drains, and I, I am not going to pull punches, I'm not going to lie. Like, it was rank in there. Like, it smelled funky. It smelled like bad fish. And, of course, there's no saltwater fish. It's all local freshwater fish from the Amazon. And, you know, the Amazon, at least in this part of the country, was not exactly like this clear, flowing, magnificent jungle river. It's like, you know, turd brown all roiled up, and come on, man, like, it's 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 the city sewer, you know what I mean? Like, it's the city sewer. I'm sure every sewer plant, you know, the regulations are different. It all runs off into the river. People bathe in the river. People are peeing in the river. There's, you know, diesel fuel in the river from all the different river boats. So it, it's not exactly this pristine environment, you know what I mean? So I'm looking at all this fish going, my God, this is so impressive, At the same time, it's like, "Ah, man, you know, I don't know if I would eat uh, any of this, frankly. So we finish the tour and, you know, we finally get to the to the mothership, to this big boat. And it's it's a beautiful, beautiful boat. And we get into our rooms and the AC is kicking. And finally, you can like, you know, wash your face and like cool down and put your stuff away. And finally, it's like travel and hustle over it is time to relax. And this boat starts churning up the river and we're all having a great time. And you know, you're freaking, you're hungry, man. Like it's dinner time. Like everybody's cranky. Everybody's hungry. So we all go down to the galley on that, that first night and, you know, beautifully set table and everything and everybody's starving. And here comes the cook and on the table, he slaps down what had to have been like a 40 pound Paku that somebody took a Sawzall and literally just cut in half down the length of the body, right? Bones and all swimming in like a clear liquid with like some tomatoes, um, just randomly sort of spread across the carcass. Now, (laughs) it's not that I was worried about getting sick or anything like that. I just looked at this and it just, it just did not appeal to me. I just, I really just didn't want to eat that. Okay. Okay. And I'm thinking to myself, like, what am I going to do? Like, I'm starving, and I don't want that. Well, lo and behold, there was a Brazilian family on the boat, a grandfather, a father, and the grandson, who was like eight years old. And we had all commented, like, man, this seems like a pretty hardcore, you know, long kind of exhausting trip to bring a kid that young on. 
but he was there. And as we're looking at this sold in half steamed Paku, out for the young lad comes a plate of chicken fingers and fries. So I, I'm sort of just nibbling at the side dishes and staring down this young boy's American chicken fingers and fries. And I, just, I wanted them so badly. But at the same time, I don't want to be like rude or disrespectful, you know, about, about the Paku. So I'm watching this kid eat, and as most little kids do, right, he had like four chicken fingers and took three bites of one of them and ate two fries and went back to playing his Game Boy or whatever the, the kids are playing these days. And after a while, I just, I finally just like could not take it anymore. And I leaned over to his dad and I was like, hey, is he done with them chicken fingers? And he's like, yeah, 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 go ahead. And I housed him. And I was like, oh man, like saved. Did not have to eat the Paku. Fast forward to the next day, okay? All the boats go out catfishing, and the idea is the mothership keeps moving, you go out and fish, and then you meet back up with the mothership that's gotten further ahead later. So there's six boats, okay, and only one of them catches one of those big red tail catfish. The catfishing was not very good. So we all meet back up at the boat later, and as it turns out, the catfish was caught very early in the morning, and once again, there's not exactly, you know a Yeti cooler full of ice on each one of these boats, and it is a billion freaking degrees. So I don't think anything of it. You know, the dude that caught it seems pretty happy, and, you know, we all go take a shower and get cleaned up, and a little while later, we go sit down in the galley, starving from a long day of fishing, and in comes the whole catfish on a plate, prepared similarly to the Paku. And that's when I was just like, I freak, I can't, I can't. And I was like, rude or not, I went... <laughs> I went to the cook and I was like, hey, bro, how many of them chicken fingers and fries you got? Okay, because I, I watched him make them for the kid again that night. And he's like, Moss, many, many, lot, tons of them. I was like, okay, I want that. And for the rest of the time on that boat, okay, it, it, all but one night, I think fish was somehow pretty much the main course. And thanks to that little kid, I got through it on his special order chicken fingers and fries. So, good lesson if you ever find yourself in the Amazon, you know, in a hosted lodge, if you are not a big fish eater, okay, prepare yourself. Let them know in the little special needs box that you that you fill out online that you're going to need some frozen white castle sliders, okay, or some chicken tenders or something or else you're going to be very not happy. There is your final tip of the podcast, on top of all the great ones that our good buddy Matt Roberts has already given us. Huge thanks to him for joining us, and I will catch you guys right here again in two weeks. And as always, thanks so much for listening to the Hookshots podcast. Shots <laughs> podcast.